Welcome back to Seekistan, and today we're going to talk about how we've made some elite athletes using CRISPR and their incredible... Is that not today's video? Oh no, sorry. Um, we're actually going to do part two. So we made a video recently, I have good genetics, a rant on genetics, which was from a live stream. Someone asked us some questions on talent versus genetics. And there was kind of... People I think have kind of some different mis or misinformed views, maybe some different uh, concepts of what genetics are and what you mean when you say genetics versus nature and nurture. I think probably the prevailing one sometimes is that we have a little bit of an emotional argument enter into nature versus nurture. So people will talk about things, they'll use words like earned, which are like emotionally charged world words. They'll use things like skill, uh, you know, hard work. We're using very, very emotionally charged words when it comes to this. The overarching sentiment, and there's a great read in the paper if you want to have a look at it, it's called Why Nature Prevails Over Nurture in the Making of the Elite Athlete. It's in part of Springer, it's in the BMC Genomics. The main thing you need to understand is that you cannot change your genetic cap as of right now, unless CRISPR has changed in the last few minutes that we don't know about since we are in the space of time it takes for this video to go up you cannot change your genetics you can change the degree to which your genetics are expressed but in terms of sporting endeavors your genetic ability is fully capped when you were born your genetic code is given to you now it may change due to mutations this is very rarely good and this is very rarely in favor of you having better mutations for sports so your UV rays aren't going to hit one of your genetic codes and knock it out and suddenly you're going to produce 10 times the natural testosterone or you're suddenly start going to producing endogenous tenazinol. That won't ever happen. Then we have a different process, methylation, which is kind of changing the level or degree of which your genes change over the course of the time. This can be quite significant. So this can be something maybe 20 to 30 percent of your gene expression can change over the course of your life. But ultimately, everything you do is influencing the level of which these are expressed. But... There is a certain degree which with things will not move in favour for you. So, I will never be LeBron James. You will never be name Solomon Manolo. You just won't ever happen. People sometimes think of genetics as this kind of abstract concept, but they really forget, and someone points out in the comments, which is great, it's like literally things like femur length, hand size, we even get things like reaction time, hand-eye coordination. All of these things are influenced by genetics. Now, your childhood, how soon you start, what kind of training you do is all just exposing your genetic ability and what could be better or worse. But ultimately, and it's never, don't ever forget this when it comes to genetics in the terms of elite athletes, you have only such an ability that can be exposed by proper training, that can be exposed by correct environment, by correct nutrition, time spent training, but all of these are simply exposing your genetics. Everyone can't be anyone. That is so important to remember. You cannot be the best in everything no matter what David Goggins tells you. I'm retired. Now, on the positive side of that, you don't know how good you can be. So you should just be training. Video over. All right, we're done. We're done, okay? But the, just really remember that, okay? You don't know how good you can be, so just start training and train as much as you can. Yeah, I think that is the main thing. Of, and it, it kind of comes along. We're going to run through some of the comments or some of the questions people had. But one of the first things pops up is we talked about like altering of genetic expression. Uh, or like altering through training how, what genes are expressed or, or how many copies of certain genes you have, right? Somebody asked, so it is Bardia Magadampur. Nailed that, I'd say. Nailed it. Uh, asked, like, what do we mean by this? What do we mean by altering genetics or altering genetic expression every time you train? So there's certain genes are responsible for certain things, obviously, right? And it just so happens there's a number of genes are responsible for athletic talent, uh, muscular development, uh, fiber type differentiation or fiber type expression so whether you're slow twitch or fast which in very very simple terms or which fibers you might have a bigger cross-sectional area of right when you train you're going to bias yourself towards certain ones right so there's a reason uh, weightlifters have big upper backs and big quads and marathon runners have narrow skinny legs and very little tissue above their midline that's due to the fact that they're training is going to push them further and further in that direction. It just so happens that a lot of marathon runners will be predisposed genetically to being those that more slender frame because they'd be better at it and they're more likely to gravitate towards that sport. And the same is, is 
true in reverse with weightlifters. A lot of the time you won't get big, tall, long, gangly people start weightlifting or starting to try and be a professional weightlifter because they're not going to be well built for it. But in the case where you bring in some sort of exercise and you then have this kind of alteration in the expression of your genes, right? If you imagine your genetic code is made up of millions and millions of these genes, right? You might have, a th or you have a certain amount of these, like one of the athletic performance genes, that ACTN3 or ACE. If you have one of those that's being triggered by some sort of athletic training, so if that's back squats or that's hill sprints or whatever it is, when you're in the recovery phase from that session, you will then get a transcription of that gene. So that gene, the amount that gene is expressed within your genetic code will multiply, might double, it might triple, however many times it might happen. And then the more times you train, the more copies of that gene you're going to see expressed in your genetic code. It's very important to note though that the amount of training can only very, very slightly alter the expression in this. And when Gurf talks about like your genetic being, or your genetics being the overall cap of how good you can be, you'll get two five-year-olds, right? One person will have a really high genetic predisposition towards sprinting. The other one might have a moderate level of predisposition towards sprinting, right? So fast twitch fibers being well expressed in their leg tissue. Both of those will be the exact same at sprinting at a certain point. If the one that's not well predisposed starts training really hard and trains for years and the other one never trains, right? So you literally get those five-year-olds become 14-year-olds, they'll both run 12 second 100 meters, right? One of them has trained really hard and the other one has never sprinted in his life. No matter how hard that first guy trains, the guy who has not great genetics for sprinting, no matter how hard he trains, he'll never get beyond a certain point. The whole thing with this video is you don't know where that point is for you. Because you might look at yourself and say, oh, I have long femurs, I'm not well built for squatting, or my vertical jump isn't very high, or it's never been very good, so I'm not going to be very good at weightlifting. You really don't know where that cap is or where that ceiling is until you train very hard for a very long time. Now, the real killer with all of this is the fact that there is going to be your little five-year-old twin who has never trained and will only just barely pick up a sport or suddenly start playing a sport and they will be better than you with it. And then when they train, they will get better again. That's just the very, very nature of, of genetics and how kind of training and physical training uh, works. So like C. Berry said something, uh, Clockoff made the claim a lot that he wasn't naturally talented. There's nothing natural about his talent. <laughs> At weightlifting, thing. But he did say that Akeev was talented, oddly enough. So again, this is kind of that... How can you say you're not naturally talented if you ended up snatching 206 kilos? I'm convinced that thing is a mentality mindset by elite athletes to encourage themselves to work harder. It's a form of kind of, you know, sometimes spite is the best encouragement or best motivation. And so kind of putting yourself as the underdog, the underdog mentality and saying that you, um, that you you're not that talented and you have to work really hard to get it can certainly assist these athletes in their career. And they may even subconsciously do this, they may not know they're doing this, they may just have to tell themselves this to get better. But I don't think anyone would argue that a man with a 225 kilo push press and a 206 kilo snatch is in any way not naturally talented at weightlifting. There wasn't zero latent genetics for weightlifting involved in clock off and then suddenly he worked really hard and he made the best of his genetics. He clearly had talent for weightlifting and there is no way around that. One of the other things that keeps popping up in the comments here is the fact that it's it's mentally bad for us to have this conversation. It, it puts people down. It's bad for developing athletes to hear this stuff, right? That's like saying, telling someone they have to train is bad. The whole thing with genetics is you're handed it the day you're born. Uh, you are stuck with this for the rest of your life. Everybody is stuck with theirs, right? So we oftentimes think about in a kind of morphological sense, right? The size and the shape of our body being dictated by genetics, but it's about so much more than that, right? Everything you have in your life is dictated by your genetic code and what happens to that. And the more you train that and the more you seek certain expressions within that genetic code. So saying it's mentally bad that, oh, people with good genetics won't work hard or someone with shit genetics, if you tell them they have bad genetics won't work hard, None of that really matters. And if it's a point where 
mentally you're not strong enough to to still remain training after someone has kind of opened your eyes to the fact you mightn't have optimal genetics then sport probably really isn't for you anyway an interesting thing about sport as well and obviously we don't have quantifiable figures for this or numbers or that i know of is that people are arguing about well not everyone might get a chance to try every sport but there does seem to be a tendency for people to drift towards what they're good at. And I've heard other people argue this before. It's kind of interesting. You just likely will find the sport you want to be good at. You may, there could literally be a visual factor where you look at stuff. Like when I looked at weightlifting when I was like 16 or whatever, there may have been something in my brain that was like, okay, that looks like something I can learn easily. Certain parts of my brain might have lit up when I saw that. And that's when I wanted to go do. Whereas when I looked at marathon running, I was like, oh God. For example, like someone said in one of the other, like it's not in this video, but someone commented. So I talked about the first time I could, I squatted a barbell, I could squat 120 for like three or four reps. And realistically, I'd probably close to a double bodyweight squat when I first started. However, that same year, I came last in a school 5K, very last. And I don't mean last as in like, Jesus, it was a tough race. It was like, oh, own still running and everyone else is finished, you know. And it's not that I hadn't trained my running, I'd done running, you know. I'd done some training like twice a week for that 5K. And I got better at running for myself, but I just was never going to be a world-class 5K runner. So it, it's interesting how it's very, very likely, I think, that people end up in sports that they're going to be good at. I think that is something that yeah. happens. I think you just drift towards it. And I think there's, you know, obviously, once you start doing something and you start enjoying it, you usually enjoy it because you get better at it. And usually that's because your genetics are probably suited for that. Now, of course, I didn't get to try every sport in the world. You didn't get to try every sport in the world. You didn't get to try every sport ever. But I think there is some part of that where your brain, I think there might be something to that where you see a sport that you want to do and then you kind of end up drifting towards that. Absolutely. I think as well people end up morphing more and more of their physiology towards a sport they're into, you know. Mm -hmm. So you'll see like the people who are really into combat sports or fighting will gradually roll the shoulders forward and they'll kind of take on the shape that a fighter would usually look to take on. Mm -hmm. That's obviously goes way beyond genetics though. Um, I actually have, an, sorry, an interesting one about that as well is you will often hear of basketball players. So they'll be like six foot when they're 12 or 13. They'll say, oh, I love playing basketball. And, and then I stopped growing and everyone else kept outgrowing me and I stopped playing basketball. And we, like literally at the seminar we did the weekend, we heard two different people yeah. talk about that. Or someone going to rugby and everyone is the same at 15. Everyone was in like kind of skinny, kind of like, um, even though people are going to the gym, they weren't that in great shape. Two years later, they rocked up into the tra or the, the warm-up room or into the changing room, and suddenly everyone else's genetics were a lot different to other yeah. people's prior genetics, you know, and that's when they start playing rugby. So I think a lot of that is involved as well, is that just how good you get as well. Yeah, 100%. Uh, the next kind of thing that keeps popping up here, it's popped up two or three times here, is that different sports have different level of genetic predisposition. So they're saying like, oh... Sports like soccer and things like that are much more skill based and okay. talent based. I have actually comments from me, Yeah. So, Too Dark Horizon commented to this and it got a little bit of discussion, which is great. I like to see that. It's also great for the algorithm as well, just in case anyone's wondering. So, basically, he said it all depends on the sports. Some sports are more skill based, others are brute strength. So, again, this isn't, this is what I was talking about at the start. It's all genetics. So, so, how fast someone gets, how good someone gets at this sport is all determined by their genetics. The nurture exposes this but I'll read on a little bit. So, soccer is less related to genetics and something like sprinting is even more so related to genetics than the sport of rugby. Uh, don't go pretending that these sports like weightlifting and sprinting are highly skilled compared to like tennis. Uh, I'd also disagree with that for sure. Uh, these sports are at the top of the list of being just brute strength. Um, again, I very much disagree with that. Uh, even Charlie Francis said himself about sprinting, there isn't much to it. Again, probably someone who's very, very talented at sprinting. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it just comes easy. Like, for example, when I was talking about squatting, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, you just, you know, just start training and you'll, you'll squat 250 after three and a half years, which we know to be not the case. Uh, you'll be surprised at how many levels there are for skills as there are levels for genetics. Uh, seeing a top lifter having lower genetics than another doesn't speak much. He or she is probably four times better genetics for a sport than the average person. People only focus on the winners. Uh, those winners were the best in their family, community, club, state, country, region, the world. They beat loads of genetically weaker competition before reaching where they are. So this person is now agreeing with us yeah. what we're saying. Um, plus it is knowledge genetics is largely also based on you grew up. So it is genetics and then how you grew up. So of course there is, there's probably 
four Olympic potential champions out there yeah. in the crowd in the city at the moment at different sports but they'll just never know because of multiple different reasons they didn't want it they didn't get a chance they have no mentality for that they have no interest in e-sport there's no system in Ireland to support them for that e-sports but again that doesn't dissuade from the fact that the best people who end up winning still have some of the best genetics for that yeah. sport the, the thing of skill right and certain sports having higher skill demands than others so it's certainly from a 30,000 foot view right that's certainly true right uh, fine motor skill is very very different in a game of badminton than it would be for throwing hammer right and, and both of them you're you're rotating across your body with some force right this fine motor skill is is more apparent when watching some sports than others right the big thing here though is that people think about genetic profiles only being in terms of your physiology the same thing that makes Lionel Messi really really good at knowing exactly where his foot is and then being able to control that foot and then control a, a soccer ball with that foot or it makes a gymnast unbelievably good at staying on a beam or whatever the sport is right all of that is controlled by genetic code it's like saying the engineer that designed the car only designs the outside of the car and he has nothing to do with the engine or he only designs the wheels of the car but nothing to do with the outside of it every single thing that happens in there is down to that design and the design is 100 percent dictated by the genetic code that's inputted into it it's a really simple system but when people talk about talent and skill and things like that they get really mixed up because talent and skill are developed through training but some people are much better at developing hand-eye coordination and hand-foot coordination fine motor skill they're better at making decisions on the field so some people have a really good sense of how to play the game or they're always in the right place at the right time that is all genetics as well they then get exposed to this nature or this environment or, or an area where they're trained, whether that's coaches around them, whether that's watching certain other athletes playing, and that gets brought out even more. But if you brought 10 players into a professional training environment in a highly skilled sport like soccer, and they're for 10 years, right, they train every day, all the coaches give them all the same attention. They play the same amount of games with the same caliber of athletes around them. They play against the same caliber of opposition. You will not get 10 equally good players out of that system. You will get a you that will describe a small amount of people who are incredibly good, a lot of people who are kind of average, and a small amount of people that are incredibly bad. And it's that genetics or that genetic code will dictate where we'll fall along that. We just get confused when you see different sports and you say weightlifting is just all about power and speed, sprinting is all about power and speed, hammer throwing, whatever it is, and you just get a small bit mixed up because you think it's just the physical aspects are made up by your genetics. Everything is controlled by your genetics. We all know the wasted talent. We probably all played sports with people who at the age of 14 or 15 were phenomenally talented at a sport and they could have gone all the way. Realistically, it's their genetics and their psychological predispositions didn't allow them to go all the way, didn't allow them to have the headspace, the understanding, the lack of neuroticism or a, a too much neuroticism, whatever it might have been. They mightn't have been able to concentrate for long enough. They mightn't have had fast enough reaction times outside of sport. And then they didn't make it all the way in sport. Your genetics makes up so much of those kind of minor aspects your IQ, all of these things are dictated by that. And it's not just the kind of physical size or stature of someone. To give you a practical example in terms of our experience with coaching athletes, and you know, at this stage, there's literally seen hundreds, thousands of athletes move through just weightlifting alone, not even the other sports fits with Zealot, for example, or the other athletes we'd see. So if we look at just weightlifters, now we're not talking about ultimate pros, or now we're not talking about the ultimate lifts people are making in relation to world records we're just talking about how fast someone gets from a 70 kilo snatch to an 80 kilo snatch or a 100 kilo snatch to a 110 kilo snatch for example we're not we're, we're not really worried about the you know the world champions here because they haven't had the opportunity and the support and stuff which we discussed there and they're all valid arguments but 
the best athletes we see or the people who make the best progress in main of thing, for example, is not always someone with the best morphology. It's not someone with the best starting point. It's not someone with the most enthusiasm. What you see, for example, is with these athletes, these are the athletes, when you make a change in their lifting, they retain that change permanently and they retain it for longer and they make that change faster than other athletes do. And it's very, very interesting to see a variety of different athletes. Funnily enough with weightlifting, most people have mostly the same different problems. Or Sorry, most people have the same problems, same technique errors. So most people have their knees too far forward. For example, one athlete, you'll tell them, get your knees out the way. And this athlete within one session will move their knees back out the way. And for ever, for the rest of their lifting career, their knees will for permanently and consistently move back out the way. And you'll never have to repeat it with this athlete. Athlete B then, for example, with their knees too far forward, you'll tell them move their knees back out the way. You may have to add different drills. You may have to add different complexes. You may have to address weak points. You may have to permanently and consistently reinforce that every session with them. And maybe in six months time, they may then get eventually their knees out the way, but it can very easily revert back to type and consistently come back with that knees forward. Whereas the initial athletes will make that change. And there's something in those athletes who are just incredibly gifted at this form of adaption and i'm literally talking about not athletes snatching 140 to 150 we're talking about natalie going from 70 75 you'll say once to this athlete and then inherently will have the ability to consistently and permanently make these changes and there's a very very clear difference across a variety of different athletes not saying people can't make change but the rate and how fast these athletes change their technique is something very very interesting and it's 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 an intrinsic factor some people just have now you can have, of course influence this again by what they did as a younger athlete how many sports they played their ability to learn different skills was influenced but again ultimately it all comes down to their ability their inherent genetic ability to change and permanently make that change the other aspect i want to talk about as well is in terms of genetics and talent and elite sports it's one of the arguments to make for allowing performance enhancing drugs to be used by all athletes. Now there's a variety of different reasons why you would say we shouldn't let them use them in terms of access athletes health, which are all great arguments. But if you just look at this argument in terms of genetics, the use of drugs in sports is something kind of interesting. For example, certain athletes may have a genetic predisposition to expel metabolites faster than other athletes. So pass tests, take more drugs closer to competition and then subsequently will have better lifts in competition or better performances or better running times but there is an argument to be made that an athlete who could take more drugs could potentially do more work even though the other athlete with better baseline genetics for those whatever those genetics may be it may give them a better opportunity to work more and somewhat level the playing field now ultimately we'd see genetic different genetic factors playing when drugs are taken but if no drug testing was available and we just had this opportunity for everyone to use performance enhancing drugs and for them to train as much as possible, we might see some closing of this genetic diversity and potentially give people a little bit more of a chance, a little bit more of a level playing field. Now, I know there's a lot of arguments against using performance enhancing drugs, but it's one particular nuance I think is quite interesting. And I've heard people, so something we've talked about ourselves. Uh, Brody Chavez made the argument, Gregory Trinkoff, the head of the Russian anti-doping agency, so he was involved in all of these sports for years in Russia. He would have seen the best of the best in the world, some of the greatest world record holders come through him and his system with the doping system. And he made this argument himself in his book. He talked about how it would probably be fairer if everyone could use performance enhancing drugs and you'd probably see a leveling of the genetic talent field or sort of genetic capacity. There is a nice little devil's advocate to be run alongside that or like a, a counterpoint to be run along is, is what you could get. And I'm not saying I believe this, but what people who do believe this say mm -hmm. is that what you'll end up getting is if you do that for long enough. So if, say if you have 100 years or 50 years of, of non-tested sport, you'll then get a genetic push or a, a push in the direction where the best athletes are people who react the best to drugs. And that it's no longer just mm -hmm. just down to like genetic talent again, but that you get uh, in the same way where the best weightlifters, the best power athletes at the moment have higher proportions of fast twitch fibers to slow twitch. You'll then get the best athletes now have a, 
a higher ability to take more drugs for longer mm-hmm. um, and it's just it's just another cog in the wheel mm-hmm. but like obviously they're losers the ones who don't want to take enough drugs so <laughs> so I think in closing I think it's just important to remember that you've no idea what your genetics are capable of what we have seen and this is very reassuring for you guys is that we have seen so while we do talk about training being a factor that exposes people's genetics we have seen people get training so very very wrong and think god i'm shit i could never be better introduce them to the correct training methods and we're not even talking about our programs or one-to-one athletes but people just listening to us talk they're like oh i I implemented some of the things you're talking about and progress went so much better you can improve a lot more than you think with the correct training methods of course our programs are there for sale but this isn't just a sales plug they're there for you they're great programs they work really well and people email us all the time we see it with athletes and one-to-one athletes people can get so much better with correct training methods not even in changing their working environment, not becoming full-time athletes, but just talking about just better training methods can expose their genetic talents. Now, we're not talking about people going from a 120 snatch to 170. But we're talking about people going from 70 to 100 in three months when it took them a year to get from 50 to 70 kind of thing. You know, we're seeing people make good progress. We're not seeing people become world beaters, but we're seeing people make good progress. So be rest assured, you find a good way of training and the correct training methods you would be so surprised how fast and how different your genetic talents can be exposed when you manipulate all these environmental factors around you. Just to add in our piggyback on that, Mm -hmm. the longer you've been training and the longer you've been plateaued for, people Mm -hmm. often think, oh, I've been training for 10 years and I haven't increased my lift in two or three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then that means that I've tried everything and I know everything. That means the opposite. Like if you keep progressing, you're probably trying the right things. You're probably doing the correct things. Yeah. The longer you've been plateaued for, the more likely it is that you're going to see bigger increases when you actually start doing a different program. I can literally, so just for weightlifters, because it's the easiest to see this kind of progress, I can think of two examples. Um, so both of these athletes have, have tested positive for drugs. Okay, so we can remove that argument for a minute. So one of them, Aaron Kroll, talked about being stuck at a 140 snatch for so long. He yeah. said he's for ages, for literally a year or more, he said he got stuck at 140. And then he went from like 140 to 170 by changing his training methods. Gabriel talked about being stuck at 160 for a very, very long period of time, I think. And then he went from like 160 to 180 in a period of like two months with a different training method. He had a different coach. So again, you know, just before he went, oh, they took different drugs, they took more drugs. It doesn't seem like that in that scenario. It was very likely the huge influence there was that training factor. So you can make great progress, I promise you. But just understand that you probably won't be, for example, Clarence. A lot of people brought up Clarence in the comments. They talked about how he had a favorable environment. I'd argue Clarence had a very anti-favorable yeah. environment in terms of um, no professional coaching for most of his weightlifting career. Uh, training alone on the second floor of a community gym. Uh, training an environment without good athletes. All these things are very, very anti. So his environment was very, very poor for his level of what he reached. But he's just incredible genetic talent oust, ousted out of yeah. and arrived at a place where he still hit phenomenal numbers. So what we do see is the best will make progress regardless and everyone else in the middle with good training can get quite good within reason and then we like Fitz to talk about the bell curve most people can get pretty good at most things within reason but then we still have people who are absolute fucking dog shit and then we have the strawberry jam out here and most people are in the middle or a mix of strawberry jam and dog shit and then this will change your kaleidoscope will change depending on what sport you're viewing it through yeah so if you are dog shit there's nothing you can do but the chances are you are for example a mix of strawberry jam and dog shit and that percentage either way will move depending on what sport you put yourself in that like we talked about before you know not everyone can snatch 120 and 50 we actually said most people can't snatch 120 and 50 and i think most people come to the sport late still can't snatch 120 and 50 but i think maybe a lot if people had started earlier you'd, you'd get a lot farther than you think you know like that's not as important to focus on but there's a lot to talk about this but let us know your thoughts in the comments and let us know what you're thinking different things yeah if you want a part three put some questions down below and we'll keep the genetics ball rolling thanks very much guys turn into a podcast yeah